Hi. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to get the standard transthoracic echocardiography views. I'll be using the Virtual Echo Echocardiography Simulator, which you can get at the link below the video. The website address is medicalworkseg.com. So this video is just about 2D echocardiography. We're not going to talk about any measurements or Doppler techniques because this is just for the absolute beginner who wants to learn how to get the basic views. Okay, so let's get started. Before we actually get any views, uh, I want to go through some anatomy and a primer on probe movements quickly. Let's start with the anatomy. I'm going to go ahead and hit T and R to make the heart clearly visible. Uh, as we can see here, the heart lies just behind the sternum uh, with the, a slight tilt to the left so that the long axis of the heart extends roughly from the manubrium sterni, if I bring back the ribs on, this bone right here, to the apex, which lies in the fifth or fourth intercostal space at or just inside the midclavicular line, which bisects the clavicle like this. We'll remove the ribs again, zoom in a little bit. I'm going to freeze the probe using the F key. So this chamber right here is the right ventricle, and this one is the right atrium, and this groove separating them contains the tricuspid valve. This here is the left ventricle, left atrium, and the mitral valve lies in between them. This little projection right here is the left atrial appendage and these vessels are the pulmonary veins entering the left atrium. This big vessel right here coming out of the RV is the pulmonary artery, the main pulmonary trunk, and it bifurcates into the right and left branches. While this vessel, this big one coming out of the left ventricle behind the pulmonary is the aorta. This is the aortic root, the ascending aorta, and this is the aortic arch with the origins of the right innominate and left carotid and subclavian coming out of it, then it loops down and travels down to form the descending thoracic aorta. That's about as much anatomy as we need for now. Now let's go over probe movements quickly. I'll unfreeze the probe. There are three kinds of probe movement. First one is just simply sliding the probe over the surface of the skin with no particular orientation. The second movement is rotation. We have clockwise rotation and anti-clockwise. Let's do this from a different angle so that you see what's going on. This is anti-clockwise. This is clockwise rotation. The third kind of movement is angulation or tilt. So tilt happens relative to the axis of the probe and it can have several directions. It can be sideways or lateral tilt like this and it can be up or down or as we call it cranial and caudal. Cranial is, is, is upwards when we look towards the head and caudal is down when we look towards the feet. Some people call it hepatic instead of caudal but either will do just fine. Okay, enough chit chat already. Let's start getting the views. As you can imagine, there there are there's an infinite number of views you can get because wherever you place the probe, you're likely to get a view of the heart that's different from the others. However, there are a number of standard echocardiographic views that have been established and are used by echocardiographers in examinations all around the world. So, the first one of these standard views is the parasternal left long axis or the left parasternal long axis. Let me bring back the ribs. The left parasternal view is obtained by placing, placing the probe in the left parasternal line at the second or third intercostal spaces. It doesn't necessarily have to be that exact spot in every patient because there's a lot of anatomical variation but that's a good place to start and work your way from there. So we place the probe in this spot and the, we need to rotate the probe so that the knob, which is this little lamp right here, this little lamp, this little green lamp, so that the knob is pointing away from the apex, like so. This allows us to cut the heart along its longitudinal axis. 
let me remove the ribs here okay so this is the view but it's a bit tilted so tilting the probe will fix it this is an example of the left long parasternal view I'll decrease the depth to make the heart seem bigger now the structures you're supposed to see in a proper left long parasternal view are the following I'll rotate a little bit open the valves okay that'll do decrease the depth a little bit I'll freeze the probe so I can point this is the left atrium this is the left ventricle separated by the mitral valve doesn't seem to be opening very well but we can fix that there we go and now at the top exiting the left ventricle is the aortic uh, the aorta with the aortic valve separating it from the ventricle this is the, the ascending aorta this is the anteroseptal left ventricular wall and this is the posterior ventricular wall this is a little teeny tiny part of the RV the right ventricle that we can see in this view okay let's try getting that view with the ribs back on and without seeing the heart unfreeze the probe okay mess it up a little bit okay so we place the probe and the second or third left space okay rotate so that the knob points away from the apex like this and just fix the tilt a little bit adjust the rotation so that the ventricle seems long that's it that's that's a good left long parasternal view okay moving on to the next view is the left short parasternal or the left parasternal short axis view we get this view by rotating the probe 90 degrees to the position of the long parasternal and let's uh, make the torso transparent again and by angulating the probe cranially or caudally we can change the level at which we cut the heart so for example this level is called the mitral valve level because we can see the two leaflets of the mitral valve the anterior and posterior leaflet and this is the RV which is sort of like crescent shaped and the LV is round if we angulate the view down a little bit or caudally we can see the mid cavitary view in which we see the mid part of the cavity the LV cavity with the papillary muscles visible so it's sometimes called papillary muscle level if we angulate a bit more we see the apical view the apex of the left ventricle which is useful to look at segmental wall motion abnormalities in the apical region while here we can look at the segmental wall motion of the mid cavitary area if we angulate up all the way we start to image the base of the heart so this this little circle in the middle contains the leaflets of the aortic valve this is the aorta cut transversely head-on and we can see the, the leaflets of the aortic valve opening and closing in the form of a triangle we need to optimize the view a little bit to get the full view what we're supposed to see here let me fix that okay okay there we go this is the parasternal short axis at the basal level because we are seeing the base of the heart now the structures we see are as follows this is the left atrium this is the right atrium and this is the inner atrial septum this is actually one of the good views to image the inner atrial septum for the presence of an, an ASD a defect this is the right ventricle and this is the tricuspid valve separating the atrium from the ventricle while this artery exiting the RV is yes you guessed it it's the pulmonary artery and this must be the pulmonic valve okay moving on to the next view we have the apical four-chamber view 
the apical four chamber view is one of the views that anybody can relate to instantly because it resembles the textbook rendering of the heart that we are all used to. We obtain this view by placing the probe at the apex and looking up towards the heart. Let me increase the depth a little bit. Okay, there you go. Okay, so this is an example of what we should see in an apical four chamber view. I'll freeze the probe. First, let's see how we're cutting the heart. We have the heart placed at the apex, pointing towards the heart along its axis, and dividing it into upper and lower halves. What we will see here is the two ventricles and two atria side by side. This is the left atrium, the left ventricle with the mitral valve in between. This is the right atrium and the right ventricle with the tricuspid valve in between. And these are the pulmonary veins entering the left atrium. This is a really useful view to examine mitral and tricuspid valve blood flow using color Doppler or using pulsed and continuous wave Doppler because the blood flow direction is in line with the Doppler, the Doppler wave direction so the signal is pretty strong. The next view is called the apical five chamber and it's called five chamber because there's an extra chamber that we see which is not really a chamber it's the aorta here we see the only four chambers of the heart but if we were to angulate the probe a little bit up we would see that now we have the aorta which is kind of like a fifth chamber so they call it a five chamber view and the aortic valve can be seen here as well and can be interrogated by Doppler to assess for stenosis or regurgitation. The next view is called the apical two chamber view. We'll get back to the apical four and then we'll rotate the probe so that the knob becomes a little bit vertical. Now we can see that we're cutting only the left ventricle and atrium. This view is useful to assess uh, the anterior and inferior segments of the LV and the mitral valve for eccentric mitral regurgitation that we couldn't have seen in the apical four chamber and it's also particularly useful because this is one of the few views in the transthoracic echo that can image the left atrial appendage for the presence of a thrombus or something. From the apical two chamber we can rotate a little bit more and maybe angulate a little bit inside so that we can see the aortic valve to get what is called the apical three chamber. You know, let's fix this a little bit. There we go. The apical three chamber view is exactly like the left parasternal view but it's flipped. Remember how the apical the, the left long parasternal view was, was just like this, but it was horizontal. The heart was horizontally oriented. This view is the same, but it's, it's vertical, and the apex is here. You, you see this white ultrasound sector thing, right? Whatever is, is right below the probe here will be displayed at the apex of this sector here. So this is the area nearest to the probe. This is the skin. So in the left parasternal, we had the probe at this point, so the first thing that met the probe was the RVOT. Here we have the probe placed at the apex, so the first thing we see is the apex. This view is again useful to look at eccentric mitral regurgitation and to assess the aorta for regurgitation or stenosis. This is also the anteroseptal wall and this is the posterior wall, same as in the left long parasternal view. Okay, these are the most commonly used views that you'll encounter so you need to start studying those and practicing them first but I have two more views for you to complete this tutorial the subcostal view and the suprasternal view the subcostal view is pretty self-explanatory you place the probe in the subcostal angle with the knob pointing outwards or towards the left side and you look towards the heart like this and you're supposed to see something pretty much similar to the apical four but from a different angle. Let's fix it like this and there we go. This is a subcostal view. We see the same 
chambers as we see in the apical four chamber view. This is a left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle with the valves in between. Now the value of this view is twofold. First of all, we can see the interatrial septum clearly because it lies more or less perpendicular to the direction of the ultrasound wave, so it's it's better imaged than than in, in a view such as the apical four where it's in line with the waves, so they can't see it very well. So this is one of the useful views to assess the interatrial inter septum for uh, for the presence of an atrial septal defect. The other value for this view is that we can by rotating the knob up, we can see the IVC, which is the inferior vena cava, let's freeze the probe, uh, exiting the right atrium. Let's look at that here. There. This is the right atrium and this is the inferior vena cava, this is the superior vena cava. And we can, through the subcostal view, we can cut the inferior vena cava. We can even do this better, like this. There we go. Okay. So this is the right atrium. isn't properly open, but we can see a part, good part of it. And this is the IVC leaving, uh, entering it. And measuring the IVC diameter and the relationship to respiration is used to uh, estimate the right atrial pressure. And that is used in turn to calculate the pulmonary artery pressure when added to the tricuspid velocity. But that's the matter for another tutorial. So that's the subcostal view. Now let's move on to the suprasternal view. In the suprasternal view, it's it's one of the more difficult views in echocardiography, especially for a beginner. But the idea is that you want to look at the aortic arch and the great vessels emerging from it. The suprasternal view lets you see the entire thoracic aorta. There we go. This is the arch. I mean, this is the arch as you see here. This is the aortic arch. See how we're cutting it here with the probe? And this this circle is the pulmonary artery because we're we're cutting it, we're bisecting it here behind the aorta. And this view is useful useful to check for a PDA, which you see as a communication between these two arteries right here. We can I think we can fine-tune this view a little bit to see the great vessels entering and leaving the arch there. That's okay, there we go. We can see the roots of the innominate and left common carotid and the subclavian arteries leaving the aorta. We can also check for aortic co coarctation in this view. So these are the basic views that you'll be encountering in echocardiography. You can use virtual echo to practice until you're confident enough and then you can move on to real patients. Uh, remember that echocardiography is all about imagination and uh, all about practice. You need to practice a lot. So don't panic at all if you place the probe where you're supposed to and then see nothing at all because chances are that's going to happen a lot especially at the start so don't give up keep practicing good luck and have fun bye